Thank you. Dear Sandy, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, I'm not sure concerning the true motives for this invitation to talk to you. Surely not, it's my ability to present in English. So, whatsoever, I'll try my best to entertain you. Yes. Uh, those three topics, uh, how dangerous is this obviously psychotic, maybe catatonic patient? How about his quality of life, his life expectancy, and how is he treated today? So the first two questions, I think you all forensic psychiatrists, will not be a problem. I'll make it very, very short. Of course, uh, there is an increased criminality, comorbid substance abuse plays a major role, but it's not able to uh, explain the, uh, the whole uh, uh, risk uh, increase, uh, increase. It's not that schizophrenic patient. It's a subgroup with well-known risk factors and which what is always forgotten that these risk factors are for a good part identical with those for high morbidity, excess mortality, suicide and victim status. And the situation for the severely mentally ill at the beginning of the 21st century is really deplorable. We have high uh, prevalences of homelessness, high uh, rates of victimization, the risk to be killed is for schizophrenic patients up to the seven-fold increase compared to the general population. Uh, uh, morbidity is higher, that all uh, leads to a, a reduction of life expectancy of more than 15 years compared to the uh, general population and it was not possible to reduce the incredibly high uh, suicide rates. So, now I'm nearly at the end of the presentation, it's just the... <laughs> but you may ask, why society, why not mental health services or psychiatrists? Uh, I think to really understand the presence, it's necessary to have a look back, to look at the development of things and please keep in mind, it's always forgotten, especially uh, from our colleagues from general psychiatry, that psychiatry has always had a peculiar, a special position among the medical uh, disciplines. It depends much more on the reigning zeitgeist, on the emotional situation of the uh, population uh, and you should remember that uh, one of the major accusations of anti-psychiatric movement in the 1960s and 1970s uh, was that we psychiatrists are only the henchmen of a repressive uh, society. Yeah? I just want to give you a few examples and they all point into the same direction. Uh, there has always been a mortality gap between patients suffering from schizophrenia and the general pop population. Uh, Saha wrote a publication about 10 or 12 years ago uh, and uh, found that the mortality gap even increased in the last two or three decades of the 20th century. Now, this is a publication uh, in the British Journal last year or two years ago and seemingly there's an improvement. The situation has become a little bit better in psychiatric patients, also <clears throat> in the general population, but in the general population much more. That means that the mortality gap even increased, especially in the years between uh, 2000, uh, 2010 and 2014. So, next stop, Zurich, Switzerland. It's a rich country with a good functioning uh, mental health system uh, and what you see here is that up to the uh, 1990s, 1993, uh, patients with schizophrenia <coughs> were the most uh, uh, often, the most frequently treated group. 
accounted for the consumption of more than one third uh, of all the days in uh, inpatient treatment. After that, the proportion decreased down to uh, 20%. And the same holds good for the annual treatment uh, prevalence. For nearly all other diagnoses, it was the other way around. You see there was an increase of uh, uh, patient years in treatment in unipolar depression, especially, uh, especially uh, also here. So uh, one conclusion could be that Swiss psychiatrists are brilliant in treating a psychosis, but they have a lot of problems in treating depression. Uh, maybe uh, could, could also be another explanation we, could, we can discuss this. And what's new, outpatient uh, treatment, during the same period there was an enormous increase of facilities uh, for outpatients. You see it here, in the same time, four outpatient clinics now, ten outpatient clinics. Interestingly, our schizophrenic patients are not consuming these, uh, these services uh, because uh, the treatment episodes of schizophrenia patients declined. And of course, that's clear, uh, the, uh, the services for the nice patients are brilliant and becoming better and becoming better. Yeah. So it's not time to go into details. Maybe you all know this uh, publication by Prihib et al. Especially we cannot discuss about the, the situation in uh, Italy, which is quite different. But in general, you find everywhere a decrease of beds in general psychiatry. And you find an enormous increase of the prison population. About 20 years ago, Paul Mullen called this the enthusiasm for incarceration, which took place uh, everywhere. And of course, in the prison populations, we could hear this uh, this morning, the rate of severely mentally ill is increasing. Uh, uh, this is not the case only in the USA, where, for example, jails are the most important uh, part of the general mental health system. Yeah. Uh, several U.S. Uh, states spend now even more money on prison services than on higher education, which can maybe partly explain the results of the last presidential elections. I don't, uh, I don't know. But I, I want to talk especially about the forensic beds and the forensic uh, population. There is an enormous increase. A very good example comes from Austria, which is a small country with 8.5 million inhabitants, uh, very low crime rates. And you see um, the prevalence of uh, offenders not guilty by reason of insanity increased within 27 uh, years, the prevalence by the five fold, uh, five, uh, 4 5 fold, and the annual incidence even by the 7.7 fold. Uh, this has, of course, and this is not only in Austria, so, but also in Germany and in most of the other countries, uh, this has, of course, uh, consequences for uh, the ratio between forensic beds and beds in general psychiatry. Here you see the development in Germany. From 1980 to the early 1990s, this decline, that means one forensic bed, uh, 32, uh, ah, uh, 32 beds in general psychiatry. This change was only due to the reduction of beds in general psychiatry. Uh, from the 1990s on, there was an additional development because the numbers of the annual uh, admissions uh, to forensic hospitals increased. That means that a couple of years ago, we had in Germany four uh, general uh, uh, beds in uh, general uh, psychiatry and one bed in forensic psychiatry. And we have in Austria more or less the same development. In Denmark it's even, it's even worse. And what's very important, uh, the population has changed. Uh, patients with schizophrenia are 
always have been overrepresented uh, in, in this population. But you see, there is an incredible increase of offenders uh, not guilty by reason of insanity with schizophrenia from more than half to three quarters. Unfortunately, we do not dispose of prevalence data of actual, but the, uh, the admissions of the last three years to the institution where I worked, uh, we had 83% of all the admissions had a first diagnosis of uh, schizophrenia. And another change, uh, the, uh, the type of offenses has also changed. Yeah? You see that uh, offenses of minor severity, for example, threat, compulsion, obstructing a police officer, which is not always that dangerous and that bad, it uh, uh, was 20% in the 1990s, now it's nearly 60%. Severe offenses, the, the rate of severe offenses went down and what's important, the absolute number of murder per year committed by uh, uh, psychiatric patients is completely stable between 3.5, 4.5 a year du uh, during the last 30 years. So, the question is what happened? What happened? Uh, of course, uh, in fact, some principles of uh, treatment in general psychiatry uh, have substantially changed. Uh, primarily, it's our attitude or the attitude of our colleagues in general psychiatry. Uh, uh, psychiatry has overcome the old, of course, negatively connoted paternalism. Now we have autonomous patients. Uh, in, in fact, they are not patients because under the influence of the social sciences they have become clients and now they are customers. So, the psychiatry should sell a product which is not really estimated by the severely mentally ill uh, customers. That's really a problem. And patience is wrong because patientia, to wait, it's not a cardinal virtue today. Uh, uh, yes, but if you look at that, this is not the right um, pair uh, of opposites because, because autonomy is a quality, an ability of the patient, the freedom of decision can be impaired due to mental illness. Pa uh, paternalism, that's our attitude. The attitude has uh, consequences to the relationship between the psychiatrist and the patient. But we should not forget that there are three more ethical principles uh, in medicine. Beneficence, non-maleficence and justice. How about them? In former times it was clear, the weight was on the right side. And under the title uh, Beneficence, psychiatry applied coercion to a high degree. To give you an example, in Austria in 1970, about 70% of all admissions to mental hospitals have been involuntary. Now, we can discuss if this is necessary, but why pressure or even coercion on an autonomous patient? I mean, the time of the gods in white is over. And that's good so. And meanwhile, of course, things have changed. Now the weight is on the left side, on the autonomy. And if we have a look, I can advise an autonomous patient, a partner, but nobody can tell me how can we advise these patients. And this is very, uh, this is very convenient. Uh, because uh, doing so, uh, general psychiatry gets rid of the so-called difficult patients. Those who compromise the reputation as modern, as liberal, as non-paternalistic, etc. This has led to a new type of colleague, which can be called placebo psychiatrist. 
Uh, I mean, don't laugh. Placebo is Latin. Placebo means I shall please. That's what they want. Nice doctors for nice patients. And the others where the, where the not nice patients are, who cares? So, the problem is there's a loss of balance at the moment. And it's not only in psychiatry or psychiatric treatment, I think. This loss of balance is determining our life in general nowadays. And there must be asked one more question. Uh, we should not forget this is dignity, human dignity. This, ladies and gentlemen, was the cell of an inmate of a forensic hospital in Germany a couple of years ago. It was by the law not allowed to treat him against his will. The only way to apply coercion was to drag him out of the cell, to clean the patient, clean the cell, because the colleagues are responsible for the hygienic standards, and then they had to throw him back again in the cell without any treatment. And this, it's very irritating. This is the opinion uh, of the German Federal Constitutional Court on the argument that psychiatric treatment has not only the aim in uh, mentally ill offenders to improve the mental state, but to pro protect the society in the future. I mean, uh, from a formal uh, principalistic uh, point of view, that's correct, of course. But I think it's very uh, cynical and hypocritical, and I think that's a good example uh, for the bigotry of our secular age. And the reasons for this development are discussed, usually under the heading psychiatry reforms. But for me the question is, is it only the psychiatry reforms? I think this is too narrowly considered. Please remember what I mentioned before concerning the special role of psychiatry in our society or in every uh, society. So, that's the situation now. Uh, guilt, okay, but danger, the future, danger, becomes more and more important. And we are uh, in Austria, for example, on the way from criminal justice to preventive justice. Uh, and these are four very important uh, issues of uh, our modern time. Uh, we have countless options, we have countless chances, and we get information, but we also are uh, exposed to countless threats. This causes, of course, anxiety. And we claim, like little children, maximal personal freedom together with uh, maximal uh, personal safety. It's a polarized world, and people are sometimes really like uh, re they remain in childish uh, regression. And of course, there are no absolute guarantees, and this causes, uh, uh, causes anxiety again. And what I told you before, uh, the form becomes more and more important, not the content. The content is too complicated to understand. This increases again uh, anxiety. And this is the, let's say, reaction of politics, in our case, criminality of the mentally ill. Uh, the, the, the politics, uh, justice and administration uh, arrogate the monopoly of definition to justify unrealistic promises because they have to act, because there's a lot of distrust from the society. And if there are problems, uh, the problem is handed over and the responsibility is handed over to psychiatry, or in our case, forensic psychiatry. I mean, the problems with the um, um, dangerous and severe personality disorder in Great Britain is a very good example. That's a political di uh, diagnosis, if you want so. 
and in Germany a couple of years, they had the same problem uh, concerning the uh, preventive custody laws. Germany was, uh, was sentenced by the European uh, Court of Human Rights because of this law. And what did the politicians? They said the redefined dangerous offenders, or maybe seemingly dangerous offenders, as mad. Now they have unsound mind. So it's not a problem of the uh, prison system, it's a problem of psychiatry. Uh, um, yeah, now I'm more or less at the end. Let me close with a hypothesis. Where our severely ill patients live and how they live uh, is not only a proxy for the quality of our general mental health services, it's also an indicator for the ethical standards of our society. I thank you.